Hello friends, my name is JP Hall, and today I would like to talk about the skip flap. Now, even though skip flap may sound very exotic, it is an evolved form of a groin flap. The groin flap was first introduced by Dr. Taylor, a great mentor of mine as well. And it's basically one of the first free flaps introduced in our practice or in our seniors practice. It was a cutaneous flap. And it was a very simple flap to elevate, as well as having a very good hidden component scar. Now, the problem was that there was a very short pedicle, and it had a donor site problem such as lymphoria. So, the, so it, was easy, it was relatively forgotten in, in the early uh, practice uh, because of the complications. And then Dr. Kuchima revisited the groin flap in 2004 and introduced it based on a skin puff rater based on a skin puff rater, the superficial circumflex iliac artery. And he defined this as the skip flap. Now, the advantage of the skip flap is that it was elevated above the defacta and it had a, um, a um, fat and a skin component. So thus you had a little bit uh, lengthier a pedicle and also you had a, a thinner flap and uh, it slowly gained the popularity of being a thin flap. Now, the biggest advantage, as you can imagine, using the skip flap is that it has a very well uh, concealed donor site. It's hidden in any underwear and even in swimwear. So instead of taking an ALT where you could leave a huge a scar in the thigh, this was well concealed. Uh, and it's also one of the uh, thinnest and I think uh, pliable uh, skin flaps um, uh, in our body. Uh, we'll be talking more in detail and how to make it thin and how uh, my modifications allowed the concept of super thin uh, flaps. Uh, there are a couple of branches, but if you use the medial branch, it's always a septocutaneous pedicle, and thus a very expedient harvest, and you could do a composite flap, uh, sometimes taking the um, iliac crest, and, some, and you could also do a composite with the lymph node. And of course, uh, understanding the anatomy will allow you to have not only a medium, but a large skin um, size uh, flap as well. So let's get into it. So let's take a look at how we elevate and how we prepare to elevate the skip flap. Now, this is a skin um, uh, topography of the skip flap, and you can see that once you draw a line between the groin and the ASIS, along this axis, uh, there are multiple puff raters that you could actually hear while using a handheld Doppler. And this blue arrow here is usually the medial puff rater, which is a septicutaneous, and this uh, orange arrow here is the one near the ASIS, which is usually the lateral or the uh, deep uh, a branch, uh, the puff rating branch of the, um, of the SCIA. Uh, you can see that both sides have the medial and the lateral branch along this axis from the groin uh, to the SIS. So there should be at least one or two uh, puff raters along this axis, and that's where how you design um, the flap. Now the dimensions is uh, if you use a medium, a range within or a little bit beyond the ASIS, it's a medium-sized flap. And, but if you, you could also take it all the way up to the flank uh, based on the lateral puff rater, which we'll be talking about in a bit, uh, and also be extended up to 32 centimeters, even 35 centimeters. Now, the width of the flap, you have to understand that if you wanna close it primarily, which is important to have a good donor site scar, around eight centimeters would suffice. But if you wanna take a, a longer a width or larger width, uh, of the flap, you could actually uh, flex the hip to close a little bit wider a uh, flap. Sometimes in the elderly, where the skin is very flexible, you could actually take it up to 13, 14 centimeters. But again, doing a pinch test uh, before you design the flap should be able to help you to get that primary closure. Now, the reason why this is so thin is if you look at the CT um, uh, finding that around the iliac crest here, you could see uh, the, the skin itself is hanging on this crest, and it always really has a very thin um, a fat layer, uh, with, even in obese patients as well. So this is very um, important um, to know anatomically that this is a very thin flap. Now, second, we just talked about the axis, and now let's talk about the puff rater itself and the vascularity. What's great about the groin is that it has three very different systems. First system, we just talked about the SCIA, which has the medial and the lateral puff rater coming from the SCIA. And if you draw a line from the ASIS to the pubic tubercle along the one middle one here, here there is the 
um, there's a superficial inferior aptogastric artery system. And if you go near the pubic tubercle mound, there's the pudendal system. So there's at least three systems in this groin area. And it's almost impossible not to include um, any perforator in this flap unless you're designing it super small. But nevertheless, Handel Dopplers will give you an idea where the exact perforators are. So you have to remember that there are three systems in the groin. Now let's take a closer look at the SCIA system. Here's an illustration uh, of, the, um, of the SCIA coming out from the femoral artery. You could see that there is a first branch. It's also called the medial branch. Dr. Koshima calls this the superficial branch. And, and there's um, a SCIA running underneath this deep fascia, sometimes passing through the sartorius, and then near the ASIS uh, perforates and give this lateral branch, or Dr. Koshima calls this the deep branch. And thus the deep branch comes up and the deep branch goes on, uh, passing uh, the ASIS and all the way axial pattern through the, um, through the flank. So the, SCI, the SCIA um, um, artery gives two perforating branches, the medial and the lateral. And knowing this anatomy is very important, especially in the design and understanding the limitation of each branch of the, uh, of the skip flap. Uh, another important anatomy here is the superficial vein. Now, superficial vein usually travels on the superficial fascia or right underneath the superficial fascia. And it's very crucial to include the superficial vein because this is an axial pattern vein going through all the way through the flank. And having this vein will allow you to have good venous drainage. Now, what's interesting is that these perforating um, um, of arteries and their uh, their um, accompanying veins usually drain to the superficial system. So ultimately, all you have to do is just take this single superficial vein because the accompanying veins usually drain to the superficial system and then just take this um, one vein and then have a much more simpler uh, one vein anastomosis. So let's take a look from the skin um, topography again, um, the medial branch, and this is a very um, uh, the medial branch uh, is relatively very constant piercing the D fascia about 4.5 centimeters lateral to the pubic, the lateral margin of the pubic tubercle and 1.5 centimeters uh, superiorly. And if you draw an oval here, uh, the, the medial perforator will always be penetrating um, uh, this deep fascia region here. Now for the lateral, it's very inconsistent where it, uh, where it penetrates. It could be near, usually it's near the ASIS, but Nevertheless, you have to do a hand doppler and make sure that you identify the lateral perforator as well. Now, we just talked about the importance of understanding the medial and the lateral branch because it has very distinct anatomical features. And when it, the anatomical features are different, the flap characteristics can be different as well. Let's take a look at the medial branch first. We just took a look at the illustration and, and you can see that it's a direct cutaneous. So it's a very easy dissection, no muscular dissection. You just have to just follow as a freestyle and then go all the way to the SCIA. And then basically that's the end of the elevation. We also talked about how constant the location is piercing through the D fascia. And, but nevertheless, it's a very short pedicle flap. Now, what's interesting is that we found out that there's two very distinct types of medial branch. One is a anchoring type, which we'll be talking about in a minute is this perforator that just goes shoots and just anchors in the subdermal plexus while around 45% the perforator travels underneath the dermis as an axial pattern perforator all the way through the flank. So as you can imagine, when you have this kind of medial branch, you could actually take a larger piece of um, skin territory. So again, with the um, anchoring type, you have a limited flap territory. With an axial perforator, you have a little bit extended uh, flap territory as well. Uh, the lymph nodes are usually being supplied from the medial branch. So if you want to take a lymph node, uh, you have to base it on the medial branch. The lateral branch, which travels underneath the D fascia and then ultimately piercing through near the ASIS, has an intermuscular path. So it's slightly difficult in dissection. Remember, the location where it pierces through the D fascia is not constant. So you have to use a handheld Doppler or the means like a duplex ultrasound to actually isolate and locate that uh, perforator. Now the pedicle is a little bit longer because as you can imagine at the extra length underneath the D fascia, you have a longer pedicle and it's mostly an axial type perforator. This is why it allows you to take extended skin pedicle, uh, skin paddle all the way to the flank to have around up to about 35 centimeter um, skin paddle 
so there's a very large buffer, very large skin paddle if you base it on the narrow branch. So it gives you a larger flap territory. And again, there's a branch from the lateral branch going through to the ASIS um, and giving um, and allows you to take uh, that piece of bone, vascularized bone with you and give a composite flap, including the bone. So you have to understand that these two distinctive perforators uh, are existing and you have to understand uh, which, type of puff, which type of flap you need and then base it on either the medial or the lateral branch. The good news is that in our practice, uh, there's not a lot of times that we need to take a composite flap with bone. In my practice, when we look back how much a lateral branch we use and how much medial branch we use, most of the times it was done for resurfacing. Around 80% of our elevation is done on the medial branch. So today I'd like to focus a little bit more on the medial branch. We published this paper uh, a couple of years back and we actually looked a little bit more deeper into the superficial um, uh, branch system of the SCIA. Now in 83% of the time, the, the medial branch actually comes out from the SCIA itself, but a lot of the times it doesn't come from the SCIA itself. Now, in the age of the um, freestyle uh, free flaps, you just have to follow a buffer. It's not really important where it originates from, but nevertheless, there's always something um, coming out constantly, 4.5 lateral and 1.5 superior to the pubic typical. And this is where you always find that nice, direct cutaneous perforator going to the skin. So that's a, a, an anatomy that you want to know if you want to base your flap on the medial branch. Now, if you have the luxury of taking a CTA, it really gives you a lot of information on whether or not the, uh, there's a, where the superficial branch, what is the you know, type of the superficial branch as, as, as also giving you a, a more information on the deep branch as well. Uh, we use more extensively now um, duplex ultrasound imaging, but in addition to the handheld Dopplers, if you have the luxury of doing it, CTA and duplex imaging really helps. So closer look here at the CTA, you could actually see the superficial branch or the medial branch coming out and the deep branch traveling toward the sartorius and passing within the sartorius and coming out later uh, near the ASIS. Remember that we actually uh, found that the medial branch actually has very two distinct type of perforator. One is an axial pattern, which travels uh, beneath the skin in an axial pattern all the way to the flank, while the other pattern is a direct cutaneous, just shooting in and, and just reaching the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the plexus. So as you can see, uh, when you have an actual pattern flap, you definitely could design a longer flap. So understanding its anatomy when you elevate, or if you have the luxury of doing a CTA, or especially a duplex ultrasound, uh, will, will allow you to actually see what type of perforator you have. So it's about half-half, and here's a typical example of an axial pattern. You could actually see uh, the, uh, the axial uh, perforator traveling along. And then uh, here's a typical example of an anchoring type. It just goes, shoots and goes straight into the dermis, and then it doesn't travel axially. And it could be actually seen. Um, and, and when you notice uh, different types of the patterns of the perforator, it allows you to change your design. So, so if you have an axial pattern, you could design a longer flap. You don't have to use the lateral branch, which is more complicated in design, but nevertheless, a complicated dissection. You have a simple dissection, just meeting the media, uh, just using the medial branch, while still having a longer uh, pedicle, um, a longer paddle, skin paddle, to give you a larger flap. So understanding this anatomy of the medial branch is quite important. Now uh, we use extensively uh, a lot of ultrasound to uh, identify. Oh, here's Can you say? So that big chunk is the uh, is the femoral artery, right? Femoral. Iliac yeah. artery, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, of the vein, as well as to show you the exact points where the medial perforator and the lateral perforators are coming out. So that's very uh, something very good to use. Now I just I want to move on from knowing the anatomy, understanding the characters of the, each um, a medial perforator as well as the lateral perforator to actually talk about a little bit, talk about the, uh, the plane of elevation. Now, Dr. Kushima's modification was taking it above uh, the deep fascia. So it's a super fascial approach, but our modification comes uh, where elevating it on or above the superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is a thin film-like layer between the deep fat and the small lobule um, superficial fat. 
And when you elevate on this plane, it's an avascular plane, so it really gives you a clear view while you're able to um, um, not injure the lymphatic system. Now, if you injure the lymphatic system, remember, um, in our, even in our cancer surgeries, when you um, do um, uh, lymph node dissection in the groin, sometimes you have a, a prolonged problem of lymphoria, and the patient has the drains on for a few months. Now, to avoid this um, injury to the lymph, uh, lymphatic system, what you, need to, what you need to do is elevate it on the superficial fascia. And as you elevate on the superficial fascia, you come across these perforators, and then uh, you uh, dissect the perforators for the source vessel. So understanding the superficial fascia gives you an avascular layer to work with while still giving you a very thin, uh, a more thinner flap, at the same time giving you the a chance to salvage or to non-injure the uh, lymphatic system. Now, this is possible because uh, Dr. Michael Sincere has shown that uh, through his work that there's a lot of linking vessels, vessels uh, in the subdermal plexus as well as direct linking vessels, which are usually located uh, within the superficial uh, fat um, uh, compartment. So I think um, elevating it on that superficial uh, fascial plane uh, will, will allow you to have the best chance of preserving the direct linking vessels <laughs> as well as preserving the 100% um, preserving the indirect linking vessels as well. Now, and you can see here, uh, this approach of using the superficial fascia is not only limited to the skip flap, but it's also could be uh, done uh, using any flaps. Another advantage of elevating it on the superficial fascia is that the, basically the function of the uh, superficial fascia is to actually, um, um, it, it's a scaffold attaching the skin to the deeper structure, um, preventing the sagging of the skin. So when you elevate it above, it loses that uh, tightness and then it allows this, uh, the skin uh, to stretch out like a full thickness graft um, and have more stretching uh, ability and, and allows a more flexible design elevating it above the superficial fascia. So there's an uh, additional advantage to that. We also talked about being an avascular plane and when it's avascular, it's easier to identify the perforator, better extensibility. And I think the donor, since it has more uh, uh, fat left, it has a better cosmesis. And of course, in the skip flap, it's able to preserve the, the lymphatic system. So our modification was elevating uh, the skip flap on that superficial fascia. So, so I want to go now and a little bit talk a little bit more on the technical aspects of the elevation uh, of the skip flap. So here, step by step, uh, traction is the key because the traction allows you to identify the superficial fascia plane more clearly. And then once you uh, see that uh, deep fat, then you know that there's a, a white film-like layer, which is the superficial uh, fascia um, uh, layer. And then on this layer, you'll be able to identify the superficial vein as well. Again, traction is more important. And as you dissect along this plane, you'll come across multiple perforators and you identify the perforators here. We do identify two perforators. And this is the superficial fascia plane again. And then we're elevated on this plane all the way, it, tracing it through the source vessel. Once you've identified these two perforators, now I want to go lateral and then to the medial, uh, try to skeletonize uh, both of the perforators, and then basically look at which is, uh, which is needed in regards of where the recipient vessel is, how large the uh, perforator is, and then basically decide which one to take because this flap is a medium-sized flap. In this, in this case, uh, we've ligated uh, the medial one and then just pick, take uh, this one and, and then uh, skeletonize going past through the defat and then passing through the defascia and then ultimately elevating the uh, flap based on this uh, perforator. So here's a quick video. Uh, sorry, it's not working. So I guess uh, and this video is also on YouTube. So for those uh, who are interested in, in, in looking at this video, please visit my YouTube site and take a look at this skip flap um, a video uh, that, that I just show you the sequence in the photos. So now let's jump on to some clinical cases here. Uh, here is a, a four-year-old female with a defect in the arm. Um, so uh, we debride it completely, elevate the skip flap in this, uh, in this child, and then basically you can see it has a great contour um, of it gives you a great contour as well as a very nice hidden uh, donor site and even, even in a four-year-old uh, patient. Uh, in, in a contracted rib space, uh, we went ahead and uh, elevated the skip flap and used it and we were able to reconstruct this hand. Uh, here is a case where we used with the deep 
uh, branch or the lateral branch, taking piece of the bone, uh, doing a one stage bone reconstruction in this diabetic foot uh, patient, uh, giving him a best functional uh, bone. You could also see the skip flap, the donor site's very nice, uh, and it contours very nicely on the dorsum of the foot. Uh, this is a patient with a chronic osteomyelitis. In this case, we take a little bit extra skip, deepithelialize part of it, uh, and then we embed it in the uh, dead space of the bone. Secondarily, come back to a, um, a bone graft, and that's the final result. As you can see here, the patient with a recurrence of the bone infection. Pre and post for elbow reconstruction, as you can see here, very nice contour. Uh, here's resurfacing of the anterior tibia. Uh, usually, the anterior tibia has a very thin skin. So you can see that uh, elevating a thin flap accommodates very well. Uh, in this region here, the, anterior, uh, the posterior tibial is located relatively superficially. So uh, the skip really works well um, uh, in the anterior portion of the leg. Here, this patient has a, um, a skin um, a defect after uh, cancer removal. As you can see here, the skip is thin enough that it also, it also joins very well even in the external ulterior canal, giving you a very good contour in this patient. The skip flap could also be used locally, as you can see here in this patient. Uh, and it was rotated based on the medial perforator. Uh, and this is the final result, as you can see here, uh, with this uh, well-reconstructed, nice contoured uh, scrotal defect. So I think uh, we talked about many points uh, in this video here today. Um, how do we consistently um, succeed in having a good skip flap? You have to understand the axis, we talked about it. Uh, you have to understand the vascular anatomy of the groin. There's three systems and the distinctive character of the medial and the lateral perforating branch. Uh, Pre-operating imaging definitely helps CT or even nowadays we're focusing more on the uh, ultrasound, duplex ultrasound. Uh, the thinner, the better. Elevating on the superficial fascia uh, gives you clear advantage of having an avascular plane having that extensibility, and also prever, uh, preventing, uh, preserving the lymphatic system uh, of having any lymphoria as complications. We also talked about some intraoperative tips as well on the technical aspect, and hopefully you could catch up with that video on YouTube. So I love this skip uh, because of the advantages that we talked about. I think understanding the medial and the lateral branch will give you definitely uh, more um, uh, choices, not only in the size of the pedicle, but also in the length of the, uh, not only the size of the paddle, but also in the length of the pedicle as well. So this has been the presentation of the skip flap and, and hopefully um, our experience uh, will help you to understand the skip flap a little bit better and have you enjoy the flap in your reconstruction. I'd like to thank my partners, Peter and John, uh, for always um, allowing me and allowing, I mean, the whole team uh, to have great results. Um, I also ask you uh, to please stay healthy in this time of chaos. It's unprecedented times, but we always have to think about the positive aspects and what this will lead um, to uh, in the future. I think this will allow us to seek new innovative methods of teaching like this through the video um, sessions. Please stay vigilant stay healthy, and I hope to see you in person uh, soon. So this is JP Hong from Korea. Take care. Bye-bye.